everybody to the July 9th, 2021, Friday, Master Tai Clear Tai Chi Mastermind meeting. Welcome, welcome. And with us today is Art Don. And, um, Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Art Don in Greenbelt, Maryland. That is about 10 miles east of Washington, D.C. Welcome. And Art Mashad in Michigan. Hi, I'm uh, representing the uh, Mid Michigan area, uh, Grand Rapids and Lansing. Welcome. And Sheila Bell in Costa Rica. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm in Costa Rica in the area called Guadacaste, and I give classes in Laveria, in Playa del Coco, and in Playa Panama. It's good to be here. And Harry Legg in Verona, New Jersey, outside of New York City. Hello there, Sifu. Yep, it's uh, New Jersey Tai Chi, and uh, we kind of handle things in this area of New York, New Jersey, and I uh, even uh, reach out to Philadelphia once in a while. So thank you. And Philip Chan in Columbus, Georgia. Hello, all. Hello, hello. Welcome. And Jim Kelly in Boca Raton, Florida, and whatever other neighboring communities he'll tell you about. Welcome. How you doing, Sifu? Uh, yes, we're pretty accessible from anywhere from Fort Lauderdale Airport up to West Palm Beach Airport <laughs> on the east coast of Florida. All right, welcome everybody. Um, today's topic is learning from nature. By the way, for some of what we're going to talk about, um, the uh, word from our sponsor, and that's the keys to internal power. Internalpowerkeys.com is the address. That's internalpowerkeys.com. And it's giving uh, you a, a, a what everybody kind of wishes they had when they started the internal arts for really getting the juice on and flowing and moving and being able to use it to do things and being able to test it to see that it really does what you're the chi that what you are what you've been told it will do in terms of the basics and getting it started. And it is the keys to that that really turns on that engine and gets it gets it working for you. And that is at internalpowerkeys.com. Uh, so learning from nature. Things you can learn from nature, which includes animals and then nature children, right? And so qualities of movement. And so just on the external side of that, you have things like posture. You look at, if you take a little child, uh, a toddler, and they're playing and they're running around and they're doing stuff, what kind of body position are they in? How is their body aligned? How are they, when they're moving and they're going down to the ground and getting up quickly and darting in and through and around things, what kind of body positions do they have? How are they getting that speed and that kind of, the kind of movement that they're getting? The same thing is true with posture for like cats. Think like a cat when it raises its back in order to get like a uh, really fast uh, striking and or really fast whole body movement and leaping and those kind of things. Dogs have this whole body integrity where, where they're kind of like one piece and they can be waving through that <clears throat> and yet their whole body is present there. And I talked to you about what, about, what, are, the, what are the different kinds of animals and kids and children and um what do they do when they're running what do you see them do do they do they lower their whole body somehow does their body take a different shape does they do they have certain ways that they move that really get them going well or that somehow like if it's a child maybe they're maybe they haven't they're they didn't think and they actually do it wrong and you see them correct for that these kinds of things um, and so I want to give you guys a chance to weigh in on that for anything that stands out to you that you may have seen or experienced in that kind of a vein. Well, I have um, actually in, in connecting with nature or taking lessons from nature when I'm looking out in the woods, for example, and I try to connect to like a, I see a vine or, you know, a, a viney sort of Bush and, and connect. I um, and, and a lot. Some of this is visualization. I try to be spontaneous, spontaneous about it. So um, I get, I actually feel the sensation or quality of being 
um, thin and supple and well, or viney. Um, and and I, I try to connect with with the vine, and just sort of get into that um, that sort of feeling and, and sensation and quality. And um, and then again if, with with a tree, if I just connect with the tree, um, I'll feel stronger and more solid, but still um, not like a steel pole in the ground, but with some flexibility, but just just more solid and sort of I can feel the sort of the sap flowing through me, which is just sort of um, gives me, helps with me with connection sort of to sure. keep everything flowing, you know, smoothly through. Um, and if I, for example, see a bird fly by in the light on a tree, um, I'll, as I, as I connect, feel my bones just becoming very, very light and hollow and, and feel, get sort of a, uh, a floating type quality to my body. So those are just, you know, when I try to connect to nature, different qualities I pick up and try to develop them and get more of that quality as I, as I connect more and have it be spontaneous and an actual connection and not just visualizing that, oh, there's a vine, I'm going to be viney, or there's a tree, I'm going to be solid, but actually have have the quality sort of take take on that quality. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mark. I'd like to second what Art is saying in that um, you find these different qualities and I love connecting to the trees, but you do want to go into it with an open mind so that you're just receiving what's really authentically there, like he's saying in a spontaneous way. Um, I was very surprised recently. I went to visit my sister in Washington state and we went to a park in Tacoma where they have some of the redwoods. And I was thrilled because I'd wanted to see the redwoods for a long time. And I always thought I would have to go to California, but they're, they're there and they're hundreds of years old and they're quite large. And um, I was super excited to put my hands on it. And then I was just like, for a minute there, I was kind of what's going on here because I didn't feel anything. And so I tested that on several different trees. And I think that, you know, by going in with an open mind. On and felt them, or you just kind of like perceive them? With well, I went in like I do with the trees that I have around home that are younger. Um, but what happened was I just needed to be patient. But I mean, what, you know? what did you use to try to feel them or what were you doing? To feel oh yeah, I put my hands on. Hands. So I put my hands on as if I were gonna push with a person, but I'm doing it with the tree. Um, and usually it takes, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds. But these bigger, older trees, they were taking 30, 40, almost like a minute to sort of let me know that, hey, I'm here. And the interesting thing is that you can even get sort of a sense of the whole, whole entire community that that is, you know, coexisting with that tree. That it's not just one entity. It's like mm -hmm. an entire community. So, but you do have to, um, you know, you don't want to project what you're expecting because then you're sort of you know robbing yourself of the opportunity to, to feel the authentic um, yeah. energy of that of that entity cool. and then um, the other big aspect of what you're talking about that that happens in my daily life is that I have a grandson who will not be two until August so he's in this phase where he's discovering all kinds of movements and he loves to experiment and see what's possible and what's not. And he's doing all kinds of stuff. So basically when he's here, I just follow his lead and, you know, he's going and doing all kinds of crazy stuff and weird positions and I'll just get on the floor and copy him. And he thinks that's hysterical, you know, because people are always trying to correct him and tell him what to do. And I'm like, no, let okay. him do what he wants. Yeah. So we have a lot of fun on the floor and on our hands and knees or, you know, he'll just like suddenly lay down and just all kinds of movements. And, and basically, I think the overarching um, difference is that he does, he's, he's more likely to crouch, he's more likely to kind of hunker um, than you see in most adult movements. And the idea of, uh, you know, being able to 
to change postures very quickly in ways that adults don't um, tend to do. So that's been a real discovery for me. It's been very nice. And you're, are, you, are you seeing the things he does or that he is doing that makes it so that he can transition and switch so easily? Yes. And there's a lot in there to, that's worth kind of incorporating and being able to take in. And like in your Tai Chi form, a lot of times people, they'll kind of get to the end and stop and then get to the end of a move and stop. And they sort of yeah. have to like really get their stuff together again to go to the next move. And by doing what you're talking about, it's like those are the states that make it so that it's one continuous, really functional action as opposed to a bunch of separate pieces. Right. He tends to um, sort of swivel through, you know, like he'll he'll bring the hips and swivel through and then follow with the rest of the body or um, pass a leg underneath him, at, you know, where other people would have stepped forward or I don't know. It's it's just it's um. It's an education to watch a child that age. It's a good natural movement that's proper. That's proper. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I could jump in and uh, again, a little bit on trees. Um, it, frequently people are using trees to feel down into the root, um, which is great. But I remember when I was having trouble with upper connection and you took me to the tree in your backyard and you said, feel upward. And some things clicked for me, which was Great. Usually the first time you do that, it's if you can feel the root and then you have and you haven't felt up the first time you feel up, it's like holy crap. You know, it's yes. really it's really different. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also as uh, learning to see energy on people, um, seeing the energy surrounding trees is something that's pretty cool. As I walk through the park here, there was a day where I'm like, it just clicked. I'm like, what the, and then I think I called you said, am I deluding myself or is there energy around the trees? Like I see around people and you're like, very good, Harry. Yes, there is. Okay. Good. Glad you can see that now. <laughs> and then one other thing I, I wouldn't necessarily will calling it learning from nature, but using nature to benefit ourselves is you can pull energy from a flower and circulate it through yourself, especially if you have an organ that you want to work on or for heart health or things like that, and then send it out, you know, the other side. And you can use that for health benefit as well, um, which is pretty neat. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like the aromatherapy, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess there'd be some. Yeah. Similar. Yep. The, uh, did you see any of the black squirrels when you were in, uh, when you went to Washington? I remember going. To yes. The and um, chipmunks as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 harry that's what you were talking about that's uh yes good stuff thank you oh yeah yeah i may uh, take this off in a, a slightly different direction I, I don't know if it's along what you were asking but I, i've always found that the tai chi is a lot different in that it has more of the natural movements of nature mm -hmm. And I, I know, you know I did weightlifting for a while and those small repetitive motions and, you know, you actually, you can feel them creating tension in the body and you can, you know, you can feel them pulling on bones. And I've seen x-rays of guys that were long-term weightlifters and they actually uh, wind up disforming their bones and their structure by creating so much stress in the body and, you know, same thing with, uh, I did running for a while and that just, it really takes its toll on your body, that repetitive, uh, motion. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and the Tai Chi is designed to, it, there's a little bit of bending. There's a little bit of exertion on muscles within the body. There's also the counter counterbalance of the stretching. So it works the lower body, the upper body. It works your balance. Uh, there's just so many different aspects. Uh, and it's more of a natural. I think the human body wasn't made, you know, it was made to hunt and forage, you know, and it, it was made to bend. It was made to lift. It was made to run for short distances. It was made to, to fight, but when you get too much into this, you know, I want to do one particular thing. It, it, I think it's detrimental to the natural 
balance of the body. And oddly enough, I think before before we started the uh, the webinar, uh, some of the guys were talking about fasting, and you know we've we've grown accustomed to eating three meals a day and and over you know overfilling ourselves. And and again, I, I don't think the body was developed. You know, as a hunter gatherer, you had times where you had more food available and other times when things were scarcer and you you went without eating for a little while so yeah some fasting but, built in uh, the, uh, um, the other thing um you know i pride myself on one of the things that we teach in our type in clear tai chi is how body power and then eventually being able to get it that if you grip something or you're pushing or you're pulling something that you immediately have access to your whole body power even in the touch itself. So the touch can be soft, but it still has whatever you weigh and the speed of movement, you know, the momentum of your whole body, whatever action is that you're doing. Um, and so it's kind of an advanced thing and considered an advanced thing. And yet, if you look at the average baby, you know, that's three months old, four months old, this kind of a thing, let them grab your finger. And what you'll feel is that their whole body just grabbed your finger. The uh, and so they've got this whole body power in every movement. The uh, and then my both my kids, when they were around the age of two to three, four, uh, at different times, woke me up by grabbing my little finger and go, Come here, daddy, and dragging me out of bed. And I either was being pulled across the floor, or if I'd really tried to stop, they would have just snapped my finger like a twig. Um, because their whole body weight was in the action. They weren't even thinking about it. It was more like, come here, daddy, you know, move and across the floor. And it was, and I was like, stop, stop, ah, you know, and, and going, and I'm going, and you know, this is okay. I'm a Thai team master being dragged across the floor by, by a three-year-old, you know, <laughs> but their natural movement lent itself to that. And so I studied up on that and, and used that as one of the things to help to get that even better and more natural and faster and, with whole body power and yet soft and relaxed in that way of just, Hey, come here and let's do this. And so there's a lot within, there's a lot in that. Cool. Uh, Mark. <clears throat> um, I, I guess what I was going to ask you was having to do with nature because, because I observe something that's, that's natural but it looks like it's actually detrimental, like bad. Um, I used to work with juvenile offenders in a residential treatment facility. So you get a lot of violent activity in there. And there's certain things that they would do when they were getting ready to fight or to attack someone. Uh, precursors that were very natural that you could see there were like an animalistic, like something almost from the animal kingdom where um, they would start to chest breathe. They would start to clench and unclench their hands. Mm -hmm. You see the adrenaline start to kick in. <clears throat> they were, they were ramping, this, ramping themselves up. Maybe they would pull their shirt off in order to posture, you know, like how, you know, you try to look bigger. Yeah. Maybe they would go chest to chest or like forehead to forehead, almost like two rams. You know what I mean? Yeah. One's trying, one's trying, I'm the alpha. You know what I mean? Yeah. Both like it's a battle for alpha kind of thing. Sure. Uh, I, I could go on and on and on and on of all sorts of like precursor signals that uh, I think uh, on some level were beneficial in the, in the street, but at some point they're not beneficial because like I could see them. You know what I mean? You could see that you know they're coming. You know they they weren't relaxed. Their their centers were very high. Yeah. Their centers of gravity were up in up in their chest. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you, they, they would get a um, uh, tunneling, tunneling vision because they're fixating on the, per, on what, on the attack and probably there's a fear component. Um, so I was just going to, I guess I want to ask you about that because that was all very natural and I could see it like almost like an animal kingdom type thing. Yeah. But it would all be an anti-Tai Chi really kind of, do you know what I mean? Sort of. I mean, there are things about it that are Tai Chi, but there are plenty of things there that are, like you say, anti-Tai Chi. And so here's the thing to know. There's the normal sort of 
internal programming, the species kind of a programming, the natural uh, fighting ritual, fighting posturing, fighting uh, mindset stuff, right? This guttural basic level like that. And so if somebody was just, if you're in the middle of the fight, that can, those, a lot of that stuff is designed to protect you and save your life in certain kinds of ways when it's really happening and it's already going on. The, what Tai Chi is doing is, is that at some point you get a full understanding of what that stuff is, kind of like what you observe, ideally. And then you're training your mind so that you're realizing what the good parts of that are, what the bad parts of that are, how they're used, and then how to have a higher level mind function to supersede that, both in terms of posture and breath and relaxation and posture and movement, right? And then also, because you see the stages or the steps, if you understand what they are, you know how to counter, like, okay, they're doing this, this comes next, then this. And it actually lets you develop the mind to counteract that at those actions that you can preempt them. And so Tai Chi is, is working on getting better and better as you go higher up in the skill level for Tai Chi as a whole. It's getting really good at moving in ways that really make that, that defend you against that kind of posturing and that kind of mindset. Um, and, but in, in a much, you know, you're, instead of being the storm, which is sort of that uh, guttural base level, you become the eye in the center, of the, the calm in the center of that storm. But you still understand the storm. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> cool. So, we're, so, yeah, go ahead. I, just comment on something. So, one of the things is that uh, in terms of aggression, there, there's sort of two parts. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not speaking as an expert, it's just stuff that I've read. Sure. But, but some combat is, a, a lot of human combat is not, is designed as much for status dominance. Yeah. Uh, with the intention, not the intention of killing the other person, but to dominate him. And that's what happens a lot in bars. Sure. And, and. It happens in gangs a lot of times too. And you want to make yourself very obvious and hopefully the other guy will just back down or will be intimidated and you can, you can beat him partly because he's intimidated. And then there's another type of aggression, which is they talk about uh, more antisocial and that's the predatory thing. And that's like people, criminals, and mm -hmm. they don't want to posture. They don't want to be obvious. They, yep. They're looking for resources. That's and right. so they want to hit you with minimal, they, they want to just surprise you. you yep. They don't want you to know that they're there until you feel them crunching down on you. That's and right. it's two different things, but some of the stuff that you were observing in the prison was the social dominance more than that asocial thing where you're looking for resources. I'm sure, I'm sure that he saw both things happen there. Ones where there was a lot of the posturing and the things going sure. on, the chest and uh, like that, and the, I'm the top dog kind of a thing. And then he also, I'm sure, saw ones where a kid just bam, plowed the other guy and dropped him before he ever knew anything was going on. And prisons think about it like there's the pecking order, but then there's where somebody comes up with a knife and just sticks the guy before it, and they didn't know it was coming. And so, yeah, you get both things, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, and I, did, I did see both. <clears throat> um, and the ones that weren't posturing were the most dangerous ones. They're the dangerous ones, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's calculating, really. Um, but even that, and I, I don't know if that has to do with nature or not, but uh, that has commonalities because they would not look at you. It was just a thing I picked up on. They would, they would like not make- They're trying make to hide. They're trying to hide. Yeah. yeah, until they can get behind you. There was an obvious emptiness. Yeah, they, they, or creep in, get close yeah. enough that they can close to the hill without stepping, yeah. So I, there, there was something natural about that because they all did it. They all had a similar way of doing yep. that. You know what I mean, that trick thing? Yep.
Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Part of what one of the things you see for the higher level Tai Chi is that is this idea of really dissolve and it's first the physical dissolved and the softness, but then more and more and more and more dissolved. And you're using it for the things like you're talking about being able to be next to somebody who really maybe is, is trying to do that assertive thing while not being threatening to them and being a hard target for them in a certain kind of way. But it becomes the ability to take whatever aggression, whatever they're putting out there and to also bring them into that dissolving so that they get dissolved also. And it goes there. Um, and so that's, that's a higher level skill, but one that is part of it, how to do that from a physical standpoint, how to do that from a mental standpoint and then a spiritual standpoint. So that way, if they've got aggression or anger or whatever the thing is, being able to take that and diffuse it and diffuse it enough to where their, their will or their desire to be an attacker like that, ideally um, goes away. Now, obviously, if they've just got it in for you, got it in for you, got it in for you, and they've been thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it, they're going to keep coming, but you can still be the very hard target under in the center of the storm in that, in that scenario. Um, obviously awareness being a key element. And then you, and then if you look at nature again, you, you, uh, smart nature, maybe not people who are together that tend to, they tend to even then lose the awareness, but most animals don't lose the awareness. They tend to have it. So if you go out and you can see, deer or the uh, other kinds of creatures like that, the awareness tends to always be on no matter what they're doing. Um, and you can see that, and especially if you can see where there's a bunch of interaction, um, other aspects of all that at play, and there's things to learn from that. Cool. Um, birds, when you were talking about birds, there's a thing that they will do for how they come in and they land on something, typically. And there's ways that their body acts when they're going to take off and fly. And there's actually action in that. And, and there's stuff to be learned there from seeing that. Uh, I heard one, one well-known Tai Chi master, he likes this in his form to go bird and then he'll move a certain way that is mimicking how a bird sort of spreads and gathers in order to move uh, like for when it's gonna take off and also for seating or, or sort of I'm trying to think how to say this, it's more of a dissolve, relax, spreading kind of a thing, and then back into your next move and using that to get that softness. And with the bird idea to have it where it's got that sort of lightness to it, even though it is fully present in its motion. Anyways. Um, the other ones are like water has different things that it will do if you're beside a lake or a river or the ocean and things that you can see water doing in different kinds of ways that it's doing it in different ways that water will act. Um, wind and different ways that wind will act everything from shear to little dust devil or, or actual tornado stuff cloud motions and how those do how when they're coming together sometimes they'll just merge straight into each other. And how that goes and sometimes where one of them will come underneath and the other one goes up over top um, and that all that kind of movement and action and, and a cold a cold front coming in and making contact to a warmth or, or heat and what goes on with that and so there's a lot of interaction there that can be that things can be learned from and how to use it and do things with it and that kind of thing. smoke and dust and things that smoke and dust will do. Some of the smoke will show you what the wind is actually doing, but there is actually ways that smoke in a still environment will act as well. And typically it doesn't just burn and straight up. It's got typically got some kind of a spiral effect to it. And yet if you're in a room that there's no air current, how's that happening, right? These kinds of things. And so really taking that and looking at it and trying to be that, you know, when the kind of actions that the smoke does, and if you're in a room and safely, obviously, where there's enough smoke, what does it do as the smoke builds up and how does that act and how does it spread and then what kind of concentrations and those kinds of things. Um, dust, depending on the, the weight of that dust and whether it's just kind of spreading out across the floor and how it gets really, or, or on concrete, and it can get really slick, even though it's dirt. Um, 
the uh, or rock dust um how it um can get caught up in the air a little bit how it um other things that that the dust itself will do anyways you get the idea um uh, now that i've said all that i'll let you guys add in some other things because you've probably seen some of those things in action in different ways that stand out to you and now a word from our sponsor is chi real the word chi is the chinese word for energy and energy is everywhere all around us physics says so the question is not does energy exist because of course energy exists the real question is, what forms of energy can human beings tap into and use? My name is Richard Clear, and internal power is what I do. After over 40 years of continuous study and research, I created a one-of-a-kind online program that my students are raving about. In it, I revealed the secrets of effortless internal power. The program has had so much success, I decided to take it to the public. In fact, the results are so powerful that I put a money-back guarantee on it. Find out more about this incredible program at internalpowerkeys.com. Thoughts, questions, comments? Well, I'm... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention waterfalls. Um, there's right. a lot going on at a waterfall, and it's very interesting to focus on different areas and different parts, and um, I would recommend that. <laughs> If you haven't visited a waterfall thinking in these terms, uh, go do that. <laughs> you have a part of the water of like where you watch the waterfall that's sort of your favorite part. I kind of like where it starts to jump off, where it's moving like from the the river, let's say, is coming in sort of in a laminar way, and then it starts to be affected by gravity. And so there's there's the smoothness that you see, and then it starts, you know losing that uh, smoothness as it falls. Yeah. But right before it gets too crazy, like there's a smoothness still. Yep. I like just working with facets of water, like um, being being surrounded by water. So I feel the, the, the thickness around me going for the sort of swimming in air type sensation where I just imagine if I were in, in a pool or in water underwater and and the, the heaviness against me as I as I move my arms um, which sort of brings in energy in a way and I, I feel it's um, the the air the atmosphere around me and um, producing waves from that and, and also then feeling the water inside me moving around, um, uh, whether it's just a sort of a slosh moving around or um, flowing through, for example, in, in one arm and out the other to um, produce a, a strong effect in one hand or the other or the arm just and again, just working with the various facets of water like that. Um, that's, that's the aqueous state in your body, yeah, I get it. Uh -huh. uh, having uh, taken the uh, water fighting method workshop back in March, and you were uh, repeating it here in New Jersey in a couple of months, uh, and being near the ocean here in New Jersey and going to the beach here, um, it's really neat to re-examine things that I kind of perhaps already knew, but didn't think of in exactly the same way, how the water, if there's something in its way, it just envelops and goes around, or how it can be incredibly hard and smash, um, and how the waves come in and then they retract and pull back, all things that we pretty much do in the water fighting method or wave uh, method, um, which is really neat to look at. Yeah, if you're interested in that, or that kind of thing, look at our events page on cleartaichi.com. Cool. Anybody else? So one of the ones that, uh, that caught my eyes last year was that uh, for many, many, many years, I've gone to a place here in the Smoky Mountains where they've got a business set up for 
tubing and and I do these kayaks that are set above the water kayaks where you you know where you're going to get wet and swim and you put your swim trunks on but it's a it's a boat uh like a kayak like a uh, fun yak uh this kind of thing anyways you sit on top and I would go down the rapids and all of that and every once in a while you flip and flip over but it doesn't happen a lot normally if you know what you're doing and and the water's conducive to it and all that kind of thing well Last year when I went, I flipped a lot and I went down a rapid that I'm used to going to where I flipped at the top of the rapid and went down the rapids without the boat and was, you know, ah, swimming and flailing and trying to get some kind of direction to it. Worried that I was going to hit my back on a rock, you know, on the spine and have a problem from that. And um some other things so got down to the bottom where the rapid just you know where it starts to empty out where the you're at the end of the rapid just but still in the rapid and on the other side you're sure out of the rapid and on calmer water where it's spilled into and that kind of thing and i felt with my feet well let me rephrase that i thought that the water there all the years that i've been doing this was about six inches deep and that the rapid was because of the rocks and all the things and because it was more shallow that the water was then moving faster and all of that. And in the middle of this rapid, what I found was that I was up to my neck in the water, not touching the bottom. You know, at one point where I was like this and I brought my body back up top and was a little bit freaked out, like, because it was a lot deeper there than I thought it was. And I was like, I don't understand how this rapid's happening. There were still rocks sticking out, but they were coming in from kind of the sides more as opposed to that middle part. And down at the bottom, that last part of the rapid before you came out, I realized was a sheer wall. So you're coming down the rapid, you're running into this wall, and then you normally just with your stuff go over top of that wall. And when my feet touched it, I immediately retracted and put them on top. Because you realize that with your feet coming in here, if you let that happen, that water is going to push you into that wall and down, and then you're not going to be able to get out of there. It's going to, it's going to drown you. And, and I hadn't realized that in all the years that I had been doing it. And so this rapid, not only was it doing this, but that rapid has been cutting into that for however many years that it's been doing that and forming that shape. And so there was a lot there to kind of unpack for study and for, for, um, and for movement and for um, a, a different aspect of T-Fang or this uplifting down under into the root and uplifting kind of a thing. It's a different direction of that, but there's action in there, uh, both cyclical action and then also this, um, this volume of water and how that water is acting in that place and the kind of directional stuff that's going on with that, both what you can't see and then what you can see, which is really pretty different, even though they're all part of that same action. Um, so anyways, good. Any other thoughts, questions before I go to the next section? All right, so remember that if you want to know more about this kind of thing and in terms of like ways that you do with your body and your breath and your mind and your posture and your relaxation and your, uh, your basic movements, uh, then you're going to want the keys to internal power. And that is at internalpowerkeys.com. That's internalpowerkeys.com. Thank you. Okay, so for internal... And I've done more of my study, like I've done some of the external study of looking at nature because my primary teacher, longer term, does that kind of thing a lot. Um, but I've also, for some of the internal action where I really wanted to get different kinds of power, different kinds of expression, or I wanted to enhance things that I was doing internally and really get a lot more juice out of them in terms of ability and things you can do, the... Uh, looking at nature for the internal aspects. And so I want you to ponder for a minute, those of you on the call and, the, and if you're home listening, what can you look for in nature, like in animals and stuff, that would really give you a key or, or a, a glimpse or, or some kind of an idea towards the internal, what in nature could you look at that would really help you to do that? Or what have you, if, you, if you've studied it or looked at it at all. 
And then I'm going to give you some examples here. So frogs, grasshoppers, and alligators jump. An alligator, if it's a 12-foot alligator, they're known to be able to jump their whole body length instantly. So you got something that's spread out this long. And we think if you've ever been up close to an alligator, either at the zoo or whatever, where you can really see it, you wouldn't think this is a creature that could instantly, like really fast, like less than a second, move its whole body length because of the way that it sort of has some width to it. And because of that length, and yet they're known for the people that work with them and all that, of being able to do whatever length they are, that length forward instantly, like, like really quick. Like if you're within reach like that and it goes for you, you're not getting away. Um, and so, uh, and the same thing for frogs or grasshoppers. If you've ever watched them and you see a grasshopper or a frog that's, you know, that's, that's half the size of this pen right here or smaller and they jump and they're getting, you know, if it was a per, if it was a human being, you might be talking about, they jump 10 stories. Imagine being able to jump 10 stories because they, the, the grasshopper and the frog for their size relative, they're able to do that. Right. Um, snake strikes. And there's both the coiled snake for like your rattlesnake type snakes. And then there's the ones where it's kind of got the falling action, like cobras and that kind of thing. And there is noticeable difference and there's things that are going on with both of them that are useful to get an understanding of as well. If you have dogs, cats, or younger children, or have been around with younger children a bit, they tend to have natural rooting, but like, like fairly skillful, really nice rooting ability, especially a cat that just, that's your cat, not going to bite you necessarily or scratch you, or at least not right away, but they don't want to be moved. They can root where your cat that normally is light and easy to pick up is like, uh, 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 you know, really, really like, like weighs a lot heavier than normal. Um, that kind of thing. My dogs like to lean my, my big dog, the big ones I've got, which are like Anatolian shepherds, uh, great Pyrenees and that thing, they'll lean on you and you go to move them. And it's like, like I'm trying to move the house. You know, they're, they're really solid like that. Um, so, and a child that's, that's not been taught not to do it yet, which ideally we wouldn't teach them not to do it. We would teach them when to do it but really dropping and rooting where they're being super, like you go to pick them up and it's like you're picking like, okay, this is not 30 pounds I'm picking up. It weighs more like a hundred, right? And they're using that rooting to do it. Um, dogs cooling their body by having their tongue out and other, and there's other ways that animals both heat and cool themselves that are interesting in terms of some of the physical actions that go on for that. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the creatures that made the rounds on the social media some years back was a, what's called a mantis shrimp and the mantis shrimp what made the, made the internet like that because it had such a snap that I'm trying to remember what they equated it to. I want to tell you, they equated it to like a gunshot or something. And yet we're talking about this little shrimp that it's, that it's phagian ability was, was next level like like not very many other creatures have that kind of power going like that um anyways i've got other ones but i want to give you guys a chance to weigh in guys and lady so sifu yeah so one of my <laughs> embarrassing distractions has been youtube and i've gotten into watch <laughs> i've gotten into watching a lot of these animal uh, people that keep animals. Yeah. So if you want to see mantis shrimp in action, where they attack, prey, and feed, there are lots of videos on YouTube. So the mantis shrimp are one of the most popular. So they have all these animal combat of, you know, snapping turtles versus crabs and all this kind yeah. of stuff. But Mantis shrimp is one of the uh, one of the big stars on all of that genre of YouTube. So we had so a, the rest of you will get addicted to watching it, but <laughs> it is fun. We were driving down the road in our truck. Um, we'd only been living here in Tennessee for about a year. This is twenty years ago, and uh, and maybe maybe three or four years, but but not very long yet. And in the middle of a road was a turtle about 
this big, like, like trash can lid size. Right. And my wife thought it was a greenback turtle, some, some kind of a, uh, you know, a turtle that, and I was looking at it going, I think that's a snapper. She was like, nah, that's, that's this other kind of turtle. That'll be fine. We'll move it off the road. She goes to move it off the road. It snapped and it literally lifted off the ground about three feet like this, where it was like, and then back down, blam. Okay. That's a snapping turtle. And it had just what you're talking about. Um, where, yeah, if it grabbed you like that with his mouth and did something, you just lost whatever it grabbed a hold of like that. It's, it's, it's gone. Um, absolutely. And so watching how they're able to, to get that kind of a power going out, um, adding to the Fajan, of course you can get that in our programs, that kind of thing. Um, and then how to aim it. And then I imagine the turtle did that as a defensive mechanism at that or at that point. But if it actually aimed it at you, had you aimed it at you, I'm thinking it would be uh, really bad. <laughs> Anyways, I would well, use that the receiving end. Yeah, go ahead. I'd say uh, watching certain uh, animals stretch when they get up shows you how much we need that. And certain animals. Uh, I, I see them here where I live all the time. Deer, they have this weird little quick shake to their body, which maybe you can explain more what that is, Sifu, but I always took it as them. Uh, that gets rid of an energy blockage when you have that shake of that nature. So yeah, perhaps that's I something that's going on. Take a little bit. Yeah. Hold on. yeah. Uh, remind me here in a minute and we'll talk about that. Okay, great. I had a, a cat, I mean, he was pretty old. Ordinarily, he didn't like to be held. He was, he was a cat and very independent. But in, in his later years, he got used to being around people more and didn't mind the handling. And, and in the last, I guess the last few days, one time I, I, I picked him up and held him and just you know, holding him. And then I, I had to put him down for some reason. And as I, I went to put him down, he wrapped his, his paws around my well, his arms around my arm, and and it was it was sort of strange because it was it was very, a very powerful grip with with the his, his arms and legs paws, but but it was it was relaxed. It was I guess a a case of the relaxed strength that I really hadn't felt like that before, and he was just demonstrating that he wanted to be held more and not put down because he was worried about things, but it was just sort of exactly what, you know, you talk about the relaxed strength you get from natural, natural power and connectedness. And that was very instructive to me. Cool. My grandson does that too. If you're holding him and he doesn't want to be put down, you try to put him down and his legs just come up and he's just gripping and it's like, he won't go down. <laughs> He's just hanging out like a little monkey, right? Yeah. Um, I was going to mention too that because we're talking a lot about um, sort of physical structure and this sort of thing, but like Harry was mentioning that that movement that the deer do and, and actually how it crosses over into the energetic aspect that we haven't talked about quite as much. Um, obviously, it's all related. So, you know, just that when you're going out and exploring these kind of things to be open to that idea of the energy, because for example, I have six dogs uh -huh. and I love to play with the dogs and push with the dogs and, 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 you know, observe them. And they, they help my reaction times. And so when we're tussling or we're playing and I can, you know, um, sort of just practice different movements with them, uh, you know, without hurting them and, and just in a playful way. Uh, but each and every one of them has a different personality, you know? So I think that a lot of times the intention of the movement um, is going to make a big difference. So like the difference that Mark was talking about with the, the kids, um, if they were posturing or if they were just like slipping in to do some fast damage, you know, there's the, the type of movement is going to reveal also sort of that flavor of energy of what's going on and, um, and how the energy is being directed into a movement. So that's also an interesting aspect to consider when you're making these um, observations. Yep, that's right. 
Uh, when when we were kids, we uh, got a collie from the pound, and uh, I think he was uh, abused by his previous owners. Oh, yeah. uh, anything would make him like shake and cower when he first arrived. Uh, but what I would notice is if he got overstressed, even a positive thing, if it, let's say it was positive, you know, like you're showing positive attention, uh, it would like it. It was like it overloaded his nervous system. And he would shake uncontrollably and then for a certain length of time and all of a sudden it was like he would reset and he was fine. It seemed like it was like a nervous system overload to me yeah, yeah. that he would fix. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's part of what the shaking's about. I'll talk about that here in, in a little bit more in a minute because it is, it is that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Anybody else? So the uh, that shaking action is is that there's a tension that comes in just from activities, from life, from like you say with that dog, it, it, it had more of that. But even in nature, that they're constantly under threat, they're constantly aware, and that shaking is getting it so that their mind that's concentrated here and the energy following that comes in, it's a redistribution of that energy back out and a full relaxation of that energy so that it's properly distributed everywhere and so that you can have whole body integrity and power. And so there's exercises that are in the Qigong that are part of the clear Tai Chi with the Fagong that we do that are specifically those kinds of exercises to redistribute that energy out and to make it so that it's the whole system is uh, invigorated and yet calmed um, at the same time and to de-stress. Um, and so it, it absolutely does that. And there is a Western researcher whose name I don't have with me here that did a study on this on animals and created some exercises for that purpose for humans as well. And that was his study was he found that every few minutes that the animals in the wild would do this and horses, you'll see them do it too and they would shiver and basically get this stress out of their body. Cool, any, any other? All right, so sound that animals make, and there's a lot of different kinds of sounds, and this is everything from think birds and your big birds, uh, maca maca macaques, macaques, this kind of, or not macaques, that's, uh, chimps, but also gorilla and ape and chimp sounds, um, snake sounds, <clears throat> uh, hawk sounds, um, the uh, even some of the insects like the locust sounds, or not locusts. I'm sorry. The uh, what do they call them? The one the cicada, cicadas, cicadas, the ones at night that you hear in the trees and stuff. Crickets. No, I'm thinking of the, uh, their, like this year we're having the 14 year version of this. Yeah, instead. those are cicadas, right. Oh, they're cicadas, yeah, yes. Um, and so those kinds of things, um, dogs and different kinds of sounds they'll make, cats and different kinds of sounds they'll make, and, and hearing those in bigger animals as well. Um, even, even some of your sea animals like dolphins or uh, whales, this kind of thing. Um, and there's a lot of different variation in sound and how that sound can be used and the vibratory qualities of that sound and, where, and that sound being used to generate power, that sound being used to generate speed, um, and then the use of the breath with that. Like how does a dog when it's running quick and how does it regulate its breathing, um, if it does, the... Uh, um, all right, so you get the idea. Questions, thoughts about that? So I'm just trying to make sure I hit the different pieces here for you too. So fighting skills, we were talking about that, how they posture for fighting, how they move for fighting, because the posturing for fighting is one thing, and then moving for fighting typically is, is fairly different, even though they may use that posture to go into the fight. And sometimes that posture like you said, it has to do with a dominance thing where that posture is not really your smartest fighting posture, right? But then how they go from there into the fighting mode 
Um, sometimes when there are fighting, if you look at them, there's things that go on. Like I've got four dogs and watching a couple of different ones play with each other. They will do things that you wouldn't expect, including the, uh, on my two small ones, the one when he's playing with him will like, basically he won't actually bite down, but he will nip at very specific targeted areas on the other dog, teaching him like where to attack and how to do it. And, and you can actually see him doing that with some real specific movement and real specific actions and real specific placements and all of that. Um, the, uh, if you can watch big cats fight, obviously somewhere where they can't get to you, uh, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of that. And even regular cats fighting, although a lot of times that can be fast enough, it's harder to pick up on. Um, Techniques, cats, monkeys, etc. cetera. Uh, power for, in the fighting and how they're getting power and generating power and what kinds of power. They'll use power in different ways. Everything from using the whole body weight to sit, to lay across something or on something or push something um, to uh, faster swipes to whole body movement where it's very evasive and all these kinds of things and power and speed like that. Anything that you've seen that caught your eye or that occurs to you while we're talking about it that kind of is in that vein. And I've seen a bunch of stuff that way. So, and you may have, you probably have too. Um, but there's a lot, but it's one thing to actually have seen it. Another thing to think it through and think about what you saw and or to study it as well. I don't know. I, I just to, to th watching, you know, cats is, has always been interesting, you know, and, and like you said, there's, there's so many, they have such control over, you know, they'll swipe or strike with the claws out at, at some times, or they'll, yeah, you know, I, you can tell when they're playing, they'll, they'll leave the claws, you know, in retracted or in, and, uh, it's almost like a different hit. It's a more solid, a solid hit instead of a swiping or glancing. Oh yeah. And yeah, you know, so that's uh, you know there are some variations. It's interesting that they can control that that aspect of it. Yes. Experienced both. Been hit by a cat where the claws were in, but it's it like had all this weight to it that was just very unexpected. And then obviously been clawed by one where where it's got this knife thing and the, like you say it's a very different kind of a hit, more much more different than you would think if you haven't experienced that. Yep, and the same thing is true. You can watch them play like two cats playing, kind of a thing. They're like uh, young cats, not quite kittens, but not adults yet. And they're playing with each other and not clawing each other, but some of the things that they're doing and how they're doing it. And there's, there's definitely lessons there. Yep. Cool. We had a, a cat, actually the same cat that it, he was declawed before we got him. And so, so we kept him inside um, well, as much as possible, but every now and then he would get out. And one time he was, was out is in the backyard. Um, we saw another cat come up to him and they did their, their male cat thing. Um, and you know, the, the one cat I I sort of assumed or, or guessed the other cat had you know claws and was doing the cat thing with claws. Our cat without claws just it, it was natural for him to do the motions. Um, and it didn't last too long. He he didn't get hurt and, and they just ran away, but he was just doing the, the same sort of motions that he would if he had claws. Um, I just thought that was sort of interesting. Yeah. And it yeah. seemed to be effective against the other cat too. You said it didn't seem to be effective? Yeah, just again, because he wasn't just ripped to shreds or anything and the cats just, you know, hissed and pawed at each other and then they turned around, I guess. But I just thought it was interesting that he reacted the same way the one would think a cat with claws would do with without the claws. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh.
All right, so one more time, the uh, word from our sponsor, promoting the keys to internal power. If you want to know how to have internal power, how to use your, how to turn on the chi, how to use some of that chi, and how to really have it so that you've got the fundamentals in that way so that it's energetic and really has this internal power going on, you'll want to get this. It is internalpowerkeys.com. That's where you can find it, internalpowerkeys.com. So, so uh, I've got some things my teachers have specifically learned from nature. Uncle Bill, um, my primary teacher for the last 26 years, the, uh, he, they put him with, um, and actually more like 28 years now, since 1994. So, and then, so in three years, that'll be 30 years anyways. Um, the, uh, they put him after he had trained to a certain point with a monkey in, in Indonesia, apparently when they keep pet monkeys, they put a stake into the ground and they have a, uh, like a, a chain or, or in this case, usually made out of like leather or something. And then they have a collar on the monkey and it's attached to the stick so it can't go too far away. And whenever he's told the story, he was, he said that his teacher said, you go over there and you kick that monkey and the monkey's only, you know, like three foot tall, two foot tall you know, uh, two and a half, two to three foot tall, not that big really. And he was like, why do I want to kick the monkey? I don't want to kick the monkey. It was like, you go kick that monkey and see, see what happens. Go kick the monkey. And he had him go kick the monkey and he kicked the monkey and he, he just described that the monkey jumped up in the air, pow, 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 beat the crap out of him and like kicked him and everything else. Boom, 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 boom. Where he just like, couldn't believe how quickly the monkey that you know just turned him inside out and then they had him study by playing around with that monkey uh for a while and it influenced it greatly influenced how he thinks about fighting and, and using the art that way the uh some things i've specifically learned from nature myself one that really stands out is that there's a punch that your whole body basically if you're standing six feet away from the target you execute this punch and you move the entire six feet and ideally it's instantly and the punch goes uh, through the target and do that. And I've been working on the punch and actually the punch will cut the, you'll hear it cut the air if it's really, really done at a high level. And so I was working on that and it was not the easiest thing to be doing and having some trouble. And I was out in front of my school in Tampa and the uh, there was a salamander down under there was a light fixture up on the wall and a salamander down here below and there were all these little flies and the salamander would like put its tongue out and its whole body would move more than a body length probably as much as two or three body lengths instantly up the wall grabbing the fly staying stuck you know like where it was still not falling off the wall on a, on a side you know, on a side wall and so it moved at least its whole body length and I watched how it did it and then went back to working on the punch and then went back and watched it do it some more and went back to working on the punch and was able to get the punch at, you know, where you could hear it pop the air and it was really instantly and where other people that were seeing me saw the improvement and were like, like, you've really got something going on with that punch. And I was like, well, I got it from Salamander. <laughs> The, uh, and so it vastly improved the quality, the strength and the power and the speed, the speed, and then the strength and the power of that punching. And I specifically got it from, from watching, from studying that anyways. What, if you, if you can think of anything that you've looked at in nature before that you really, or with children again, whatever, that something that you really picked up on that really helped you to improve or to develop a skill. Um, I want to finish today by just letting you guys share that. And then I think that'll be it for now. Well, I would, I would just say, and this is sort of building on the experience with my cat grabbing me with relaxed strength, or as has been mentioned, a a, 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 an infant that gra grabbing a, a body part of someone or is holding on with a lot of power trying to develop the, the relaxed strength of um, 
whole body connection and putting all of one's body strength into a small area to use to um, grab, grab, hold on to, or punch. Cool. I would say uh, when uh, my daughter was little and I went to pick her up and she didn't want to be picked up. Yep. She goes super heavy and then she'd wiggle and you just <laughs> couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't hang on to her. Couldn't hang on to her. Yeah. Couldn't get her up. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sheila. So my example goes back to water. Water is always my favorite. So, <laughs> um, on several occasions when students are having difficulty with certain movements, and especially I think sort of the transitions in between movements, um, I send them to the ocean, I send them to the pool and have them do their form with the water, in the water and get, yeah, so it slows them down. They feel a little bit of resistance and they come back with a much better body position. So um, that's one thing I like to recommend for them and it seems to be effective. A lot more whole body movement too. Yeah. yeah, if you if you get out of whack, you're going to feel it more in the water because you're floating, you know, whereas if you're on the ground, the gravity sort of stabilizes you when you're in the water, that stability has to be because you're in a good position, not because of just gravity pulling you down. So um, it, it's it's nice. Cool. Excellent. One of the things they do in Indonesia is they go train in the river. And so a lot of times when you see the style, some, not all the styles, but a bunch of the styles, they're very forward and in there constantly, like really in there against even a lot of resistance and people that haven't experienced that. If they feel one of these guys where they're just playing, they're like, how is he so in there against like all sorts of resistance? Well, they're training in the river with the water coming at them the whole time doing their stuff. And so it's constant pressure coming the other direction. Yeah, Harry. Uh, I like and, and agree and, and use everything everyone has mentioned. Uh, I just have to go back to the tree because I have all my students do what you had me do, both for root and for upper connection. Yeah, for and it works. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely feeling that and helping to get to transfer that quality into your own body. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Bill? Uh, I don't have anything to add right now. Thanks. Okay. Jim? Yeah. I think I'm on the side. Oh, it's... Jim, you're, you're, yep, we're getting that uh, garble thingy. Try again. Oh. I am better. Ooh. Can you hear me now? A little better. A little better? All right. Yeah, that's better. Maybe. Relocate a little bit. Okay. <laughs> now, um, as I said, with the with the grand with the grandson, I know it's it's an interesting the energy that's involved in the different moods. You know, the little guy can be in a you know in in a very loving mood. And it'll grab you around the neck and without that, you know, muscular, but it's almost like a smothering hug. And it's uh, when he's not in a good mood or when something's not going right, you know, you mentioned the weight drop and all of this, but it, they're definitely, even at that young age, there are different types of energies that you can feel coming from them, which, uh, it's a, it's an interesting, they don't, I guess they, they're just learning how to control them or forgetting how to control them, depending upon how yeah. they're raised, <laughs> yeah. but it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to, to feel them and reach back inside them with the same energy and see their reaction and, you know, the, the whole, oh, you can do this too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Cool, man. All right. Yep, like I said, a lot of the, lot of the, that whole body grip, um, too, where there's, where you can tell it's everything they've got's in there, and they're yet they're not straining to get it. It's soft, but yet it's very powerful. 
And so good stuff. All right, uh, guys, lady, it's been great talking to you today. Uh, remember, if you want to know more about internal power, get the keys to the internal power so that you really can turn it on and make it work for you. Um, keys to internal power, which is at internalpowerkeys.com. And we've got a write up there so you can see a little more about what it's about too. And so check out internalpowerkeys.com. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening today. We look forward to next time. Thank you, Sifu. Thank you. Good discussion. And now a word from our sponsor. For those of you who are interested in internal power and want a reliable place to start, and for anyone who wants to experience internal power for themselves, go to internalpowerguide.com. I built a crash course in hands-on internal power. The practical guide to internal power is a work at your own pace online program. It is the course I use to get students from zero to 60 as quickly as possible. And it is totally free. So sign up at internalpowerguide.com now and get started right away. That's internalpowerguide.com.